Hi, and welcome to another episode of Wonders of Chemistry with Mickey G. In this presentation, I will give an overview of how fatty acids are transported from the cytosol and into the mitochondrial matrix in preparation for beta oxidation. As you may recall, fat is stored within adipose tissue cells in the form of tags. These lipid molecules consist of four segments, a glycerol backbone with one, two, and three fatty acids joined to the glycerol backbone by three ester bonds. You might also recall that before fatty acid transport can occur, these fatty acids need to be released from their constituent glycerol backbone. The hydrolysis of these three ester bonds by specific enzymes in the presence of specific catabolic hormones helps to facilitate this process. The process, termed lipolysis, has the capacity to release all three fatty acids, which are now no longer attached to their parent glycerol backbone. This represents the first major step in catabolic fat metabolism. Now, during exercise, skeletal muscle has a number of potential sources of fatty acids, the largest of which are extracellular stores originating from adipose tissue. Fatty acids released into the bloodstream from adipose tissue from the hydrolysis of tags are bound to plasma albumin and transported to skeletal muscle where they are transferred by special proteins termed CD36 into the cytosol of muscle cells. Here, they await transport into the matrix. Fatty acids cannot be metabolized for energy within the cytosol. This occurs within the energy burning factories of cells called mitochondria. Here is an illustration of an enlarged mitochondrion within the cytosol of a cell. Mitochondria are surrounded by not one, but two membranes the outer mitochondrial membrane, which is highly permeable to small substances, and the inner mitochondrial membrane, which is not. Separating these two membranes is the intermembrane space. Step two of catabolic fat metabolism involves the transport of fatty acids from the cytosol through both the outer and inner mitochondrial membranes and into the matrix of mitochondria, where they are subsequently used by beta oxidation during step three to produce ATP to meet cellular needs. While short and medium chain fatty acids can cross freely across both these membranes, long chain fatty acids require a transport system known as the carnitine shuttle. Central to this transport system is the dipeptide known as L-carnitine which is produced in the liver by combining the two essential amino acids, L-lysine with L-methionine. L-carnitine also comes from the food you consume and more specifically from red meat. The carnitine shuttle is divided into two main steps, which I am about to explain. Before I do so, let's further enlarge the mitochondrion so that we can see how these steps unfold in greater detail. The first major step of the carnitine shuttle involves the activation of fatty acids with coenzyme A, yielding acyl coenzyme A, with the acyl segment representing the original fatty acid. Located at the outer mitochondrial membrane are a group of enzymes known as acyl-CoA synthetases, which are responsible for promoting the activation of fatty acids. This is an ATP requiring reaction. The number of ATPs required for this step needs to be accounted for when calculating the total yield of ATP produced from the beta oxidation of fatty acids. Although only one ATP is actually required, two ATPs are commonly used to account for this activation process when calculating the total yield of ATP from beta oxidation. This leaves some students confused when it comes to the number of ATPs required for this activation process. Based on this, let's quickly have a look at why two ATPs, as opposed to just the one, is used in calculations estimating the total yield of ATP from the beta oxidation of fatty acids. Okay, let's begin with the first energy producing reaction, which unlike what some students might be accustomed to, produces 
adenosine monophosphate, AMP, NA, pyrophosphate, as opposed to adenosine diphosphate, known as ADP, and a single phosphate group. The reason for this is that the hydrolysis occurs between the first and second phosphate groups and not the second and third. This produces an intact pair of phosphates bonded to one another and is termed a pyrophosphate. The hydrolysis of this single phosphate bond marked by the yellow arrow releases 7.3 kilocalories worth of energy. During the second energy producing reaction, the pyrophosphate molecule, and more specifically its single phosphate bond, is hydrolyzed, releasing a further 7.3 kilocalories worth of energy. So in summary, a total of two high energy phosphate bonds are hydrolyzed, as indicated by the arrows within this illustration, with each releasing 7.3 kilocalories worth of energy, giving a total of 14.6 kilocalories. It is this combined energy derived from the hydrolysis of these two phosphate bonds that drives the activation process to completion. What is crucial about this process is the number of high energy phosphate bonds that are hydrolyzed. These bonds, which are colored in red, release the same amount of energy during hydrolysis. Based on this, we could theoretically take two ATPs and hydrolyze the terminal phosphates from each molecule to yield two ADPs. And this would result in the same amount of energy as seen in the previous example. Once again, two high energy phosphate bonds have been hydrolyzed, as indicated by the arrows in the illustration. But in this case, from two separate ATP molecules. Now, when calculating the total yield of ATP from the beta oxidation of fatty acids, it is important to subtract the energy for activation. This is most conveniently achieved by using an activation energy equivalent to the hydrolysis of two ATPs to give two ADPs. Hence the reason we commonly observe two ATPs being subtracted from the total ATPs produced from the beta oxidation of fatty acids as opposed to just the one. So, for example, if the beta oxidation of a saturated fatty acid is calculated to produce 108 ATPs, the total yield would be 108 minus 2 ATPs for activation, resulting in 106. Okay, let's get back to the presentation. So, in summary, the activation process requires the equivalent energy of 2 ATPs. The inner mitochondrial membrane is impermeable to acyl CoAs. Based on this, the acyl group, which represents the long chain fatty acid, must be conjugated to a carnitine molecule to form acyl carnitine. This dislodges the coenzyme A, which subsequently goes back to the previous step to activate yet another fatty acid. Carnitine acyl carnitine translocase is responsible for transporting the acyl carnitine across the inner mitochondrial membrane. Once in the matrix, carnitine offloads its acyl passenger and then shuttles back into the intermembrane space, using the same transport protein to repeat the process again. While this is happening, the free acyl group combines with yet another coenzyme A within the matrix to reproduce acyl coenzyme A as seen on the other side of the inner membrane. A quick note regarding the transport proteins before I go any further. While the same membrane-bound transporter is involved in both the transport of acyl carnitine into the matrix and then carnitine back out, the shuttling of these molecules occurs within each individual transporter and not separate ones, as illustrated in my previous diagram. So I just wanted to emphasize this point just in case this might be deemed examinable. In short, carnitine, acyl carnitine translocate works via an anti-porter mechanism with one molecule entering while another is exiting. Okay, let's get back to the presentation. This brings us to the next major step in the catabolic breakdown of fats which involves step three and the process of beta oxidation, 
which I'll be covering in detail over my next three episodes. For now, however, let's quickly summarize what we have learned from this presentation. Number one, unlike short and medium chain fatty acids, long chain fatty acids require transport into the matrix from the cytosol. This transport system comes in the form of a carnitine shuttle, which comprises of L-carnitine and an antiporter located within the inner membrane. Three, before transport can occur, fatty acids need to be activated to give fatty air cell coenzyme A. Four, carnitine displaces coenzyme A and carries the fatty acyl group into the matrix via its transporter, known as carnitine acyl carnitine translocate. And finally, five, once in the matrix, carnitine offloads the fatty acyl group and returns back to the inner membrane space, utilizing the same transporter to pick up and transport yet another fatty acyl group into the matrix. Now, during times of need, for example, during extended and repeated bouts of physical activity, the process continues to bring fatty acyl groups into the matrix, supplying energy to cells via the process of beta oxidation. As stated, my next episodes will be covering the process of beta oxidation. So please subscribe and click the bell icon to be notified when this is released. Finally, if you found this to be useful, please click like. Thank you for listening.